Here is a succinct summary of the behaviour of the Israeli state, as with Western backing and active complicity, it executes one of the great crimes of our age. Kill. Lie. Kill. Lie. Kill. Lie. Ad infinitum. And what they specifically do after they commit an atrocity is pump the airwaves full of deceit, deflection, distortion. Their strategy is to muddy the waters, gaslight, tell you not to trust your lying eyes and your lying ears, we could go on. And then they wait for attention to move on and for their atrocity to be forgotten, at best remembered as yet another murky episode which can be poorly understood amidst the fog of war. Well, on this channel, we're not going to let the Israeli state get away with that. So let's return to one of the major atrocities, which there are many, perpetrated by the Israeli state in Gaza, which is the so-called Flower Massacre, which we covered at the time. This massacre happened on the 29th of February, when at least 118 Palestinians were slaughtered by the Israeli military in Gaza City, with 760 injured, some seriously. These were desperately hungry Palestinian civilians waiting for food from aid trucks, which had been blocked by the Israeli state for a long time from entering northern Gaza as famine befalls it. Now, the Israeli state lied through their teeth about this massacre. They claimed they'd fired warning shots in the air to deter a crowd, and then they became scared because of a mob of Palestinians moving towards them, so they opened fire, and that caused a mass panic and a stampede. Let's look, for example, at the version of events proffered by Elon Levy, shall we, who was then Israeli government spokesperson, but has since been sacked. At the time I tweeted, the Israeli army just massacred over 100 Palestinians as they tried to get flour for their families. Israeli tanks then ran over the dead and injured bodies. The Israeli state is committing these atrocities knowing it can get away with anything. Now, Elon Levy then quote tweeted what I said at the time. Blood libel, he wrote. These poor people were killed when they were crushed in a stampede and in some cases run over by the Gazan truck drivers as they try to get out. But go ahead, blame Israel. Now, before I just say anything, notice how he tried to point the fingers there at Gazan truck drivers. It was actually Palestinians who did this. Let's just process here, too, the disgusting and all-too-common attempt to invoke blood libel. This is the vile anti-Semitic conspiracy claim, smear, disgusting anti-Semitism, which has caused throughout history the slaughter and persecution of innocent Jewish people, in which Jews are accused of murdering Christians in order to use their blood whilst performing religious rituals. What on earth does that have to do with the Israeli state objectively killing huge numbers of people? Blood libel is about something that didn't happen. Jewish people were not going round and are not now going round either killing Christians or indeed anyone else to use their blood in religious rituals, obviously. It's not a conspiracy theory to point out that the Israeli state, notes, not the same as the Jewish people, is killing huge numbers of Palestinian civilians. That's a fact. And nobody is suggesting that they're being killed to use their blood in religious rituals either. Just listen to this. It's deranged that I even have to engage with this total insanity. That was an official government spokesperson of Israel at the time. But it shows how apologists for Israel completely irresponsibly strip anti-Semitism of its meaning when anti-Semitism is a grave, grave, grave evil, when it's not only just real, but also increasing. Well, a detailed new investigation by CNN has revealed that the account offered by the Israeli state, including its then spokesperson, Elon Levy, was false. While the account offered by people my, like myself, or indeed the accounts we were supporting, were entirely correct. It's striking this comes from CNN because an investigation earlier this year drew from testimonies of CNN journalists who accused their own media organisation of journalistic malpractice because of its pro-Israel bias. So it matters when even this media organisation is doing a piece of investigative journalism like this. The CNN article is entitled Dying for Bag of Flour. Videos and eyewitness accounts cast doubt on Israel's timeline of deadly Gaza aid delivery. It refers to the flour massacre as one of the single deadliest mass casualty events to take place in Gaza in the last six months after over a month of Israel blocking aid from arriving into northern Gaza. Itself, I would note, which we'll discuss further, as part of a genocidal attempt to deliberately starve the people of Gaza. They note that, well, I would note, sorry, it's not noted in this article. Again, part of the problem. We'll come on to that. Israel's leaders made clear publicly they were going to starve the people of Gaza from the start, which should be in every single article, every single article, when we're talking about the question of food and aid. It isn't. That is journalistic malpractice there. Now, they note, CNN, that this massacre followed what the United Nations had called a pattern of Israeli attacks on civilians desperately seeking food amid unprecedented levels of starvation. 
CNN's investigation was based on testimonies and videos from 22 eyewitnesses. What the survivors of this massacre recalled was Israeli troops firing on crowds as they tried desperately to reach food aid. In an indication of the sheer level of desperation we're discussing here, the CNN article says many said they were undeterred by the bullets, believing that if they weren't killed as empty to get the flour, they would die of hunger instead. They note the contradictory accounts of Israeli spokespeople with the smooth-talking propagandist slash special advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu, Mark Regev, initially telling CNN that Israeli troops had not even been involved at all. While another spokesperson, Daniel Hagari, then said soldiers hadn't fired directly at Palestinians seeking aid, but rather fired warning shots in the air. These people keep spreading claims which are false. Media organisations should make that clear. Again, journalistic malpractice. These people are just thrown on air and treated as though they're serious people rather than people with a track record of saying things which are not true about matters of life and death and severe atrocities. Now, CNN also notes drone footage released by the Israeli military claiming to show a stampede in which Palestinians were trampled with tanks there to secure the convoy. But the quality they note, and crucially the editing of their footage, made it, quote-unquote, difficult to confirm their claims. The question of editing here really is key. They say the crucial moment capturing uh, what caused the crowd to scatter is missing. Utterly shameless by the Israeli military. They released footage which excluded the very key component, the reason why the crowd scattered. Because as we'll see, it's because they were fired at by Israeli soldiers. Want interception here, again, by the IDF. Now, CNN also say about the footage, it shows just how difficult it would have been to fire with any degree of accuracy at what the IDF describes as suspects among the tightly packed people surrounding the convoy. So the claims that they could, in any sense, target any so-called suspects here is, is gibberish. They also said that, the CNN say, that the IDF has denied their request for the full unedited drone footage from February 29th. Oh, I bet they did. I bet they did. There was no reason whatsoever for the IDF not to release unedited footage unless they had something to hide. You would have to be completely delusional to blame otherwise. Now, according to CNN, their analysis of dozens of videos and testimonies from eyewitnesses cast doubt on Israel's version of events. A euphemism, just to be clear, for Israel's authorities lying with wanton abandon. According to their evidence, which was reviewed by forensic and ballistic experts, automatic gunfire began before the IDF said the convoy began crossing through the checkpoint and that shots were fired within close range of crowds that gathered for food. Now, the eyewitness videos, according to CNN, drawing on their metadata, that is, included the time that these, fil these videos were actually filmed. And they contradict claims, according to CN, made by the IDF about when their soldiers began the shooting. The videos began in the hours before the incident. So groups of Palestinians sitting around fires, walking around the beach, a state of calm there as these crowds gather in anticipation of food arriving. Desperately hungry people at the time, of course, because of food aid prevented by CNN but sorry, prevented by Israel from entering. Now, according to the videos, with their med metadata, gunfire can be heard ringing out and people seen running away, urging others to flee, warning of a tank seven minutes before the IDF said the convoy had crossed into northern Gaza. Another video shows gunfire two minutes before the IDF claims to have fired warning shots. And according to a gunfire acoustics expert, his testimony corroborated by another expert, the burst indicated heavy automatic gunfire, 600 rounds per minute. That is not warning shots. That is automatic gunfire at 600 rounds a minute. That's what you're doing if you're massacring people. Now, other videos similarly show such gunfire, people running, suddenly falling, being injured. As dawn broke, videos show dead bodies, some with wounds to their head and chest, scattered across the coast, survivors attending to the dead. Now, CNN also interviewed seven survivors, they say, treated at what was Gaza's largest hospital, Shifa, which has since been destroyed entirely by the Israeli military. And... These survivors had been shot, including one shot by the IDF as they carried a bag of flour. They spoke to a doctor who tried to get food for his family, who saw people panicking when the Israeli military began firing. He himself was shot in his left leg. The piece goes on that the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNRWA, the main aid humanitarian agency in Gaza, always note that, is blocked by Israel from making aid deliveries to northern Gaza, adding rather euphemistically that this attack, which we could, should be calling a massacre, always raises serious questions about whether the Israeli military can facilitate the safe distribution of desperately needed assistance. You're not kidding, are you? You're not kidding. Given they're massacring huge numbers of people as they desperately try and get food for no reason, as this entire investigation 
underlines. Now, the UN Office for the High Commission for Human Rights documented reports of at least 26 attacks on civilians waiting for aid at just two roundabouts in Gaza City. Now, we have to put all of this into context, which is, as even the British Foreign Secretary David Cameron detailed in a public letter, Israel had prevented aid from getting into Gaza at all by all sorts of ruses. Insufficient land routes, absurd delays caused by multiple and unnecessary screenings, arbitrary rejections, um, just stopping aid getting into the Sabbath. Sabbath, we could get on. We could go on. Crucially, he contradicted claims by Elon Levy over Israel allowing unlimited aid into Gaza. Le Levy was fired subsequently or around that period by the Israeli state. Clearly, well, I think it's very clear that was connected. But in any case, so many ruses to stop aid from getting in. Now, to add to all of that, we've had Israeli protesters allowed to block humanitarian aid from getting in, quite unlike the brutal treatment of anti-government protesters in Tel Aviv. We've had the killing of well over 200 aid workers, overwhelmingly Palestinian, the biggest killing of aid workers in such a short space of time ever recorded. That number also now includes, of course, the World Central Kitchen Massacre, which caused outrage because the victims were Westerners. But an absurd investigation to what happened there by the Israeli authorities raises far more questions than the answers. We've had the mass destruction of roads, so very difficult to allow aid to tra be transported around Gaza, given the destruction of infrastructure, as well as Israel deliberately targeting police officers whose job it is to protect that aid, despite even the protests of the Biden administration for that reason. We've had the mass destruction of agriculture and food production in Gaza, not spoken about enough. It's not just about less aid getting in, but you need far more aid because you're not... Gaza's unable to produce the food it had it was producing before, clearly. We've had Israel blocking aid from getting into northern Gaza altogether where famine is underway. Crucially, the attempt to destroy UNRWA, that main humanitarian agency in Gaza I keep referring to, based on an unsubstantiated smear campaign. That's a key plank of the starvation policy. As UNRWA's director of planning, Sam Rose, says today, it must be the backbone of any humanitarian response if mass starvation is to be avoided. But Israel has succeeded in getting multiple donor states to defund it, some belatedly restoring access, but the US Congress is banning funding of UNRWA until at least March 2025 because of this genocidal smear campaign. It is genocidal because you are starving people to death. Now, I would know after the World Central Kitchen Massacre, when the US actually used some limited leverage for change over its client state, Israel, Israel suddenly reopened 20 bakeries, the water pipeline in northern Gaza, which they've deliberately shut off, as we can see, and the Erez border crossing into northern Gaza, proving conclusively it was blocking aid from getting in. They could have done that all before. They didn't. They chose not to. Why? Because let's be clear, Israel is deliberately starving the population of Gaza. We know this because the evidence is overwhelming. Blocking aid from getting in. Blocking aid from being transported within Gaza to people who need it. Blocking aid from being safely distributed. Slaughtering aid workers. Waging war on the main humanitarian agency, UNRWA. And massacring civilians trying to get food aid. We also know this because of the statements of Israeli leaders and officials from the start. Most notably, Yov Galan, defence minister, one of the three members of the Israeli war cabinet who declared on 9th of October, I have ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. There will be no electricity, no food, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals and we are acting accordingly. We also have the words, for example, of Gura Island, an Israeli general, former head of Israel's National Security Council, and an advisor to Galan, who at the very start supported the siege of Gaza in which he declared... The entire population will have to leave, either temporarily or permanently, adding the people should be told they have two choices, to stay and starve or to leave. He also declared, in order to make the siege effective, we have to prevent others from giving assistance to Gaza. I'd say pretty relevant, given the mass slaughter of aid workers. As I've said re repeatedly, they said from the start what they were going to do. That intent should have defined all media coverage of what Israel was doing, but it didn't. Many of these statements were barely even referred to, if at all. It's as though what Israel... Israeli leaders and official promise wasn't real, like it was something happening in a parallel universe that wasn't relevant. And as I keep saying, that's the greatest media scandal of our time, because Israel made clear exactly what it was going to do from the start. They followed it to the letter, and Western media coverage failed to reflect that, ensuring they aided and abetted one of the worst crimes of our age. So to conclude, the Israeli state kills and lies and kills and lies and kills and lies. That should always be our starting point when we hear about these atrocities. That's the case with the World Central Kitchen Massacre. Note how Western governments have not demanded the release of all unedited drone footage of that massacre, even though Western aid workers, their own people, were massacred. Note how Israel is refusing to allow foreign journalists into Gaza. Why? Because they would see so many atrocities that we're not even aware of. And we should also, of course, bear all this in mind when we're talking about the destruction of Al-Shifa Hospital, which is the biggest hospital in Gaza, where hundreds of bodies 
are now being uncovered. They made all sorts of claims about who they've slaughtered in Al-Shifa Hospital. Well, why don't they release the footage of what they did to Al-Shifa Hospital? Because destroying the medical system of Gaza, which has now been all but destroyed, is itself a genocidal act. It imposes a daily death sentence on people who are ill, sick, injured, infirm, pregnant, newborn babies. We could go on. So here, we will keep analysing and publicising Israel's atrocities. We won't allow them to just shift the conversation away, just pump a load of misinformation and deceits and deflection until everyone gets bored and moves on. We're not going to do that. It's important we publicise these atrocities and their lies about these atrocities and keep remembering the atrocities they did, make sure we get all the evidence out, and it shouldn't have been clear what the flower massacre was from the start, given... Palatine doctors noted they were treating huge numbers of people with bullet wounds. That was pretty good evidence because we've got to ensure the truth gets out, even if most media outlets let them get away with it. We're not going to do that. Please like, please subscribe, please share the video, please share your comments. Keep the show on the road on patreon.com forward slash 084. Listen to on the podcast. Speak to you soon.